Hey everybody, it's Mike. It's Monday, April 18th, 2022. And with this presentation, I'm going to take you through some charts and some video to explore and analyze the Beatles' timeline between the period of 1960 through 1963. It is obviously an important piece of Beatle history. It marks the beginning of the Beatles' story, but does the story hold together? So we're going to review key events along the timeline, especially with regard to elapsed time, and then ask ourselves, did four inexperienced young men become the greatest rock band in history organically, or was it all manufactured? And so with that, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so to get started, what I did was to create this timeline, which starts in January of 1960, and goes through December 1963 and then heading into when the Beatles arrived in America on February 7th, 1964. And you can see I populated the timeline with some baseline data. So the first piece of data is we are told John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. They signed their contract with EMI in June of 1962. In 1960, John Lennon was 20 years old, Paul was 18, and George was 17. Starting in January 1961 through 1963, the Beatles' live performance schedule was non-stop. It was practically daily. And I will leave a link down below in the description box so you can check for yourself. The Hamburg performances were especially grueling. Their first Hamburg gig was on August 12, 1960, and that's going to be our stake in the ground. We will take a look at all the other events using Hamburg and that date, August 12, 1960, as the baseline, and then we will move forward from there. As we proceed, keep in mind the persistent live performance schedule is a constant that runs in parallel with the events we will examine. And the live performances is denoted on the chart by this blue bar, which starts in 1961 and runs through the end of 1963. Okay, so here's a clip that I had in some other videos. It goes back years ago, and Pete Best is being interviewed and asked about the Hamburg days and what it was like. And what we're going to hear Pete say is that the Beatles would arrive at the club by 6 p.m. They would play eight hours a night. They would then go to sleep, wake up at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and then have to be back at the club by 6 p.m. So clearly, Hamburg was not a time when John Lennon and Paul McCartney were heads down writing music. Let's take a listen. How did you spend your time outside the club when you were basically through working? What'd you do? Well, by the time we'd finished working, in those days we used to work eight hours a night. We'd start at six and finish at two in the morning during right. the week. What'd you do before? In other words, your basic time for enjoying yourself was mm -hmm. before and maybe a little uh, after, but mo most of the time before. What did you do before, before you went into the club? Well, by the time we'd woken up, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, great. Now that you had, you know, all sorts of time. You had mm -hmm. two hours to do what? Yeah, well... You walk around and you see the rest of Hamburg? Yeah, well, we, you know, the first time we were there, we were like, as well as being musicians, we How were How did tourists. people take, take you when you walked around? Did you walk around in black leather jackets? Uh, after about a month, we walked around in black leather people jackets. People stare at you all the time? Oh, yeah, all the time. Okay, so there you go. That's Pete Best explaining what Hamburg was all about. Playing eight hours a night, going to sleep, waking up at 3 p.m., and then having to be back at the club by 6 p.m. So I don't think there was a whole lot of songwriting taking place. All right, so let's now move to the next slide, and I have two more clips. Both of these clips are sourced from the documentary The Complete Beatles, which was a documentary, I think it came out in the 1980s. And both of these clips are in my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? The first one I'm going to play, they are telling us, and again, this is the official narrative, that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962, and remember, they signed their contract with EMI in June of 1962. So, let's take a listen. 
John and Paul had written at least a hundred songs together since they met in 1956, but they hadn't recorded any, original or otherwise. Not until they went to Hamburg again in 1960 did they make their first record, and then only as a backup group for their friend Tony Sheridan. The result? An awkward rock and roll arrangement of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Okay, so one of the questions I always ask whenever I'm talking about the 1960 through 1963 period is if John and Paul did indeed write 100 songs between 1956 and 1962, where are those songs? Especially as they make their way into the Decca audition, where they recorded 15 songs, and of those 15 songs, 12 were covers, and then there were three nondescript originals. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's now listen to this clip, also from the Complete Beatles. And this is Alan Williams, who was the Beatles' first manager or handler that brought them to Hamburg. And let's take a listen to what Alan says about getting them booked in Germany. The first gigs outside the college was at the Jacaranda, which was a, a tiny uh, little coffee bar where they played in the cellar. I think they got about uh, five shilling each. The Jacaranda was owned by Alan Williams, a small-time entrepreneur operating on Liverpool's Bohemian Fringe. His latest enterprise was supplying rock and roll groups to a club in Hamburg, when no other act was available, Williams proposed the Beatles. The group that was playing there was one of the, the big groups in Liverpool, which was uh, Derry and the Seniors, featuring Howie Casey, the lead. And he sent me a letter over saying, look, Alan, we've got a good thing going over here for all the Liverpool groups. But if you send that bum group, the Beatles, over to Hamburg, you're going to louse it all up. For God's sake, don't send them. Isn't that interesting? The Beatles were thought of as a bum group, and Alan Williams was told, don't send them over. Okay, so now I have some George Martin clips. The first video is in my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? And the second video is not. This is something that somebody sent me going back a number of months ago, and it's a very interesting clip. But let's play this one first, and let's take a listen to what George says about his impressions of the Beatles upon meeting them. So Brian then had this tape, which he hawked around. And I think it was somebody in the HMV shop on Oxford Street mm. knew George Martin and told Brian to go and play the tape to George Martin. And then he gave us the audition at um, Abbey Road. What I said to Brian was, if you want me to judge them on what you're playing me, I'm sorry, I have to turn you down. And he was so disappointed, I felt really sorry for him actually, because he an earnest young man. And you must, you must have liked him then? I did, I did like him. And I, I said, but I tell you what, I gave him a lifeline. I said, if you want to bring them down from Liverpool, I'll give them an hour in the studio, okay? George had done little of the, uh, no rock and roll when we met him, and we'd never been in the studio, so we did a lot of learning together. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. I first met the Beatles in 1962. I wasn't terribly impressed with the first stuff they did. I couldn't make up the sound, you know, it was something I hadn't heard before. They had this wonderful charisma. They, they made you feel good to be with them. Mm. And uh, I thought their music was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they had uh, nothing really behind them, they were still fairly irreverent, even in those days, which I, which I loved, you know. I, I, I like a little bit of rebel in people, and I like their sense of humour. Uh, after all, that was my main stock in trade, too. And I guess they quite liked what I've been doing with Peter Sellers and the Goons and that kind of thing. So I looked at these four guys and thought, well, none of them shines as being above all the others. And I had to make up my mind, in my silly mind, who the lead singer was going to be. Suddenly I realized I would take them as they were, as a group. The hell with a lead singer. They would be singing together. So we were struggling with the sound a bit. And I said to 
the boys after we'd done a few takes of rather nondescript songs. I said, come into the control room and have a listen and see what we've been doing. And uh, if there's anything you don't like, tell us. Well, I was looking for something original because I didn't want to do one of the oldies that they've been doing as part of their act. And Love Me Do was the best song that they, I could find from them at that time. I was very conscious that it wasn't the, the big hit I was looking for. Okay, so that's George Martin. And we can see that he wasn't very impressed. And some of the things that he said weren't even close to being flattering by calling their music rubbish. Let's move now to the second video. It's a short clip. And in it, we're going to hear George Martin say, they certainly had no, and then we see him searching for the right words. And then continues, it wasn't too obvious they could be songwriters at this stage, but their songs were pretty awful. And then I detect an audio edit, and I wasn't sure maybe it was because he said something that was even more unflattering than what he already said. Just a thought. And then he finishes up by saying, Love Me Do was the best they had, which is very similar to what he said in the first clip. So let's take a listen. I spent a few hours with them in Abbey Road and fell in love with them because they had great charisma. They certainly had no, uh, no didn't, it, was, it wasn't at all obvious that they could be songwriters at this stage because their songs were pretty awful. Even then, Love Me Do was the best thing yeah. we had. They certainly had no, Okay, so when I listened to this clip, it almost sounded to me like what George Martin was going to say was, they certainly had no songwriting skills, and their songs were pretty awful. And when he started the sentence by saying they certainly had no, he caught himself. And then he couched it by saying it wasn't too obvious they could be songwriters at the stage, but their songs were pretty awful. And then we get the talking point about the boys being charismatic and Love Me Do was the best song that they had, which, by the way, is a direct contradiction to the official narrative. Because if we go back to the Complete Beatles documentary, the clip I just played before, it's telling us that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. So they should have had this huge portfolio of original compositions coming into their meeting with George Martin. And yet, George Martin is not saying that. He's telling us they didn't have anything. So with that, let's move to the next slide and summarize what we heard from George Martin. Okay, so this is the last chart before I get into the actual timeline analysis. I thought it was important to set the stage with the official narrative along with contradictions within the official narrative. And what I'm going to do with this chart is to summarize what George Martin said by pulling out key phrases. So he told Brian Epstein, I'm sorry, I need to turn you down. So he was not planning on signing the Beatles. He said that he wasn't terribly impressed. He thought their music was rubbish. He thought they had really nothing behind them and that none of them shines above all the others. And Love Me Do was the best song he could find from them. And he knew it wasn't the big hit that he was looking for. Okay, so with that background, let's go to the next slide and we're going to take a look at the timeline. Okay, folks, it's a couple of days later. I had to get some stuff taken care of, but I'm back now and I'm going to take you through the timeline. And as you can see, it's very populated. There's a lot of information, but no fear, I will step you through it. Now, the first thing I want to call out is that the Beatles went from their first Hamburg gig, which was on August 12, 1960, to the United States in approximately three and a half years. And as many of you know, the Beatles landed in America on February 7th, 1964. So it is a very aggressive progression through the timeline. And the way I'm going to take you through this is I'm going to go to each event and you see they are numbered and we're going to go in that order. 
Okay? So, number one, as we know, we are told by the official narrative that John Lennon and Paul McCartney allegedly wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. And based upon the clips I played of George Martin to set the stage for the timeline discussion, we can see that this piece of the narrative begins to fall apart. And not only does it dissolve based upon what George Martin has told us, but you're going to see that it begins to fall apart as we make our way through each of the events going from 1960 through the end of 1963. And then moving over to number two, this is just background and a reminder that in 1960, John Lennon was only 20 years old, Paul was 18, George was 17, and so the Beatles were a young, inexperienced, rough around the edges bar and club band. And based upon the clips we just listened to, their musician or playing abilities were average at best. And going back to the George Martin clips, there is no indication or proof of songwriting skills. So just keep that in mind as we make our way through the timeline. Now, number three is a very important thread that runs across the timeline. It starts in January of 1961, right through the end of 1963 and beyond. And it has to do with the Beatles' very aggressive live performance schedule, where they were playing locally, within the UK, and of course, in Hamburg. And the reason why it's important is because the Beatles were playing almost daily, and therefore, it's a constant activity that runs through the timeline. So while everything else is going on down here, in the background, we have the live performances taking place. And this kind of schedule, and I'll leave a link down below in the description box. You can take a look for yourself. It is very aggressive, and like I said, they're playing on practically a daily basis. Is not conducive to the songwriting process. So let's just say they had songwriting abilities. And we're questioning that, right, based upon what George Martin has told us. Even if they were songwriters, this live performance schedule, this very aggressive schedule, was not conducive to the songwriting process. So what was really going on? Well, Tavistock was not looking to hone their songwriting skills. Tavistock already had their songwriters. They were looking to hone the Beatles' performance skills. So when the time came that Tavistock was going to throw the switch on Beatlemania, the Beatles were ready. They were going to take the show on the road. That is what this is all about. Okay, so with that, let's move to event number four. Now, event number four, their first gig in Hamburg, which was on August 12, 1960, is going to be our stake in the ground for all the other events that take place after it. And that's why I have the little start button here. This date is very important. Okay, so Hamburg, August 12, 1960. And remember, at this point, the Beatles are a young, inexperienced, rough around the edges bar and club band. Their music and playing abilities is average at best, and there is no indication or proof of songwriting skills. So keep that in mind as we move to the other events. Now moving to event number five, this is the DECA audition, which took place on January 1st, 1962. And I always found it interesting that DECA would open its doors on New Year's Day. When most other businesses are closed for the holiday, DECA availed itself to the Beatles. So we are told that the Beatles recorded 15 songs for the demo, three of which were original Lennon and McCartney compositions, and those songs were Like Dreamers Do, Hello Little Girl, and Love of the Loved. And what's interesting, none of these original songs make their way onto any of the Beatles' official album releases. We don't see like Dreamers Do or Hello Little Girl make it onto vinyl until the release of Anthology 1 and Love of the Loved 
remains officially unreleased. So what that tells us is the quality of the songs were not at a level where EMI felt comfortable releasing them as album tracks or singles. And of course, we all know the end result of the DECA audition, DECA declines to sign the Beatles. And if we take a moment and go back to box one, where the official narrative says that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962, and that I mentioned earlier that we would see this narrative begin to fall apart, we can actually see that here with the Decca audition, because of the 15 songs, only three were Lennon and McCartney originals, or allegedly Lennon and McCartney originals. And if we take a look at the yellow box at the lower left of the chart, I did some elapsed time calculations. And the amount of time in between their debut gig in Hamburg on August 12, 1960, and their DECA audition on January 1, 1962, is one year, four months, and 20 days. So in only 16 months, this young, inexperienced, rough around the edges bar and club band with average playing skills and with no indication or proof of songwriting ability are auditioning at DECA, a major record label. So I would say that this is an indication that there's some stuff going on behind the scenes and this progression from Hamburg to the DECA audition in 16 months is not organic. So let's move to event number six. And this is where we have Brian Epstein pitching the Beatles to George Martin. And we know that George Martin declines. He tells Brian, thanks, but no thanks. He's not going to sign them. And in the clips I played earlier, we know that George Martin said that he thought that their music was rubbish and that they had nothing behind them. Now, a logical question to ask at this point is, if George Martin turned Brian Epstein down and said, no, I'm not going to sign them, then how did the Beatles wind up back with George Martin and EMI? So Memoirs explains that after George turned Brian down, George received a phone call from a superior who told George, you're going to take them on. So George Martin was overruled. And now we have another example where a big time producer says, no, I'm not going to take this band on. I listen to the tapes. It's not what I want to work with. And then he gets a phone call. And he's told, wrong answer. You're going to take them on. So again, another indication that we have this orchestration and this engineering taking place, which is pushing the Beatles through the pipeline. Okay, so let's now talk about the EMI contract, and that would be event number seven. So the EMI contract was signed on June 18th, 1962. And if that date seems familiar to you, that's because it's Biological Paul's birthday. Coincidence? I'll let you decide. And I have an asterisk there, and I'll explain it in a moment. Now, I already explained that George Martin declined to sign the Beatles initially when Brian Epstein brought the tapes to him, and George was overruled. So, now the Beatles have a contract with EMI. But George Martin did not initially work directly with the Beatles. He had assigned that task. He delegated it to Ron Richards, who was an assistant. And Ron Richards later on worked with the Hollies. And so Ron had the Beatles in the studio on June 6th of 1962. And that's why I have the asterisk. So what were the Beatles doing at EMI before the contract was signed? That seems a little odd. Now, some people might argue, well, 
they knew they were going to sign him and the signing of the contract was a formality. So they had them in the studio. So that could be a logical explanation, but we'll just leave that there. But the main point is that George Martin wasn't working with him directly. I don't think he wanted to work with them. So he pushed it down the chain and he had Ron Richards work with them. So in memoirs, we're told that Ron is working with them. He's teaching them songs and he's recording them. And then after the session, George Martin and Brian Epstein are listening to the playback and they're not satisfied with what they hear. And it was at this point that George Martin received another phone call and he was told he had to work with the Beatles directly. In other words, George could not delegate the work to Ron Richards or anybody else on his staff. He was told he himself personally was going to manage and handle the Beatles. So again, we have another indication that this is not a process that is flowing naturally. This is not organic. Phone calls are being made. George Martin is being told you need to sign him. Then George is being told that he has to work with him directly. Okay, so we're starting to get the picture now. And I should also note that Gordon Thompson, who is the author of the book, Please Please Me, 60s British Pop Inside Out, also discusses the June 6th date as well. And if we take a look at the elapsed time between their first gig in Hamburg, again, August 12th, 1960, to when the EMI contract was signed, June 18th, 1962, it's one year, 10 months, and six days. So 22 months after their debut in Hamburg, the Beatles now have a signed contract with a major record label with George Martin as their producer. Okay, so with that, let's move to event number eight. And many of you are familiar with the Mercy Beat article. It came from the August-September 1962 edition. It was presented in my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? And I had it in a couple of other presentations. The article was to announce that Pete Best was out and Ringo Starr was in. But along with making that announcement, the article also tells us that the Beatles will fly to London to make recordings at EMI Studios. They will be recording numbers that have been specifically written for the group, which they have received from their recording manager, George Martin. So this narrative, along with aligning with what we heard George Martin say about his initial impressions of the Beatles, that they had nothing behind them, as an example, it also further collapses the narrative that John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote 100 songs between 1956 and 1962. Because if they were prolific songwriters and writing great songs, then George Martin wouldn't be giving them songs to play. That's just logic. Okay? So that's the Mercy Beat article. And as I've mentioned, it is a smoking gun. Okay, let's move now to the release of Please Please Me, which was released on March 22nd, 1963. And it's important to note that Please Please Me was released only two years and seven months after the Beatles performed their first gig in Hamburg on August 12th, 1960. Okay, so to talk about Please Please Me, I'm going to review this chart. And this is a chronology of events leading up to the release of the Beatles' debut album, Please Please Me, on March 22nd, 1963. So as we know, the Beatles performed their first Hamburg gig on August 12, 1960. They are a young, inexperienced band with average at best musician skills with no indication or proof of songwriting ability. And then a mere 16 months after their debut Hamburg gig, they land an audition with Decca. And we are told they recorded 15 songs in approximately six to seven hours, of which three are nondescript originals. Decca declines to take them on board. 
Then after Decca, we have Brian Epstein pitching the band to George Martin, and George Martin also turns them down, stating that they had nothing behind them and he thought their music was rubbish. And then the next three bullets come to us per memoirs. After being declined by both Decca and EMI, Martin's decision is reversed and the Beatles are signed to an EMI contract on June 18, 1962. George Martin assigns Ron Johnson to work with the band to record working sessions. The output of the sessions was deemed unacceptable by both George Martin and Brian Epstein, at which point George Martin is instructed to manage and handle the band directly, meaning no delegating. Then, per the August-September Mercy Beat article, Pete Best is replaced with Ringo Starr, and the article also states the Beatles will be flying to London to record songs specifically written for them, which they received from George Martin. Now, up to this point, aside from the three original compositions from the Decca audition, there is still no indication of extraordinary songwriting skills. Then we have Please Please Me being released only nine months after the signing of the EMI contract. The official narrative tells us the Beatles recorded 10 of 14 songs for Please Please Me in a single day in one long recording session at EMI Studios on February 11, 1963. Please Please Me contains 14 songs, of which eight are Lennon and McCartney originals. Now, remember that thread on the timeline chart that had to do with the Beatles' live performances? Well, as all of these events are taking place, the Beatles are performing continuously, virtually every day. So the question becomes, when were John and Paul writing music? And what was really going on behind the scenes? And I'm hoping at this point you can see what's going on. Please Please Me hit the top of the UK album charts in May of 1963 and remained there for 30 weeks before being replaced by With The Beatles, which was their second UK album release. So from zero, meaning their debut gig in Hamburg on August 12, 1960, to Hero, the release of their Please Please Me album in a little over two and a half years. Now we have to ask ourselves, how realistic is this narrative? And with that, let's talk about the Faustian bargain. Okay, so event number 10 in the red box is the Faustian bargain, which Memoirs tells us took place on October 24th, 1963. It is one of the more controversial aspects of Memoirs. Many people believe this is fictional and it didn't take place. And of course, there are others that understand that these types of packs take place all the time in the music and entertainment industry. But the interesting thing with the Faustian bargain, if it took place, is that it occurred after the release of Please Please Me. And to explain why the Faustian bargain took place after the release of Please Please Me, I'm going to take you to another chart. Okay, so like I said, the Faustian bargain is one of the more controversial pieces of information that comes to us from the memoirs of Billy Shears. So memoirs tells us that the Faustian bargain took place on October 24th, 1963 which was 216 days after Please Please Me was released on March 22nd of 1963. And 216, when we do the numerology, reduces to the number 9. The reason the Faustian bargain came after Please Please Me is because the controllers need to show and have the Beatles experience fame and fortune. And as I just covered, Please Please Me spent 30 weeks at the top of the UK charts. So the reason why they did this was to whet the band's appetite for more success. Now the thing is, with these packs, they need to be consensual, which means John and Paul 
must consent. It has to be of their own free will. But enticing is allowed. Because the premise being, even if you are being enticed, if you have free will, you can decline the offer. And apparently, according to memoirs, John and Paul did not decline. So the controllers would ask, do you like the fame? Do you love the success? The money? There's a lot more if you agree to certain, quote, terms. And according to memoirs, John and Paul agreed to the terms to give their life for the band's success and immortality. And giving their life for the band's success is referred to in memoirs as death for success. And the immortality piece would be to be known as the greatest songwriting team of all time, and their legacy would live on forever. Now, the question becomes, did John and Paul really understand what it is that they got themselves into? In 1963, John was 23 years old, Paul was 21, and my guess is if this Faustian bargain took place is that they did not fully understand. So when they had the ceremony or the ritual or however these things happen, and they were talking about giving your life for the band, I'm not sure that two young guys at 23 and 21 years old took that literally. It's likely that it was taken metaphorically. In other words, giving my life would mean working very hard to make things happen, to achieve that success. So the question of whether they really understood what they entered into, I would say probably not. Okay, so with that, Let's move back to the timeline chart and let's talk a little bit about with the Beatles and then we'll talk a bit about the Beatles landing in America on February 7th, 1964. Okay, so going to box 11, the Beatles release with the Beatles on November 22nd, 1963. That's the same date that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And like Please Please Me, it contains 14 songs of which eight are originals. And remember, we're not seeing any indication of this extraordinary songwriting ability from Lennon and McCartney. And as I mentioned earlier, as all of these events are taking place, especially when they're supposed to be writing songs and in the recording studio, we have the Beatles beating the pavement, continuously playing live right through the entire timeline. So the question is, are they writing the music or is the music being written for them? And if we go down to the yellow box here, we can see that the elapsed time between Please Please Me and the release of With the Beatles is only eight months. They have rockets on their shoes. Last but not least, before I get to the last chart, the Beatles arrive in America on February 7th, 1964, and February 7th, 1964 is encoded with 9-11. So if we take the month, 2, and we add it to the day, 7, 2 plus 7 equals 9, and if we take the year, 1964, and in numerology, 9's equals 0, we have 1 plus 6, which is 7, plus 4 equals 11. So, the Beatles arriving in America, which is referred to as the Beatles conquering America, has 9-11 numerology embedded in the date. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move to the last chart where I have some elapsed time calculations where I'm using the date of August 12th, 1960 as the stake in the ground. That's their debut gig in Hamburg. And we're going to see some very interesting patterns with regard to numbers.
Okay, folks, so here it is, the last chart, and it's titled Elapsed Time from Hamburg, August 12, 1960. And August 12, 1960, when we do the numerology, is 8 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 9 plus 6 plus 0 equals 27, which equals 2 plus 7, which of course equals 9. So August 12, 1960 reduces to the number 9. So now I'm going to go through some of the events that we just looked at on the timeline. And then we're going to take a look at the elapsed time. And then we're going to convert the elapsed time to seconds, minutes, and hours. And you're going to see something that is very extraordinary. So the DECA audition took place on January 1st, 1962. And remember, I said it was interesting to me that DECA would open its doors on New Year's Day. To bring the Beatles in. And why would that be? Well, that's because January 1st, 1962 reduces to the number 11, which is a master number in the occult. And the elapsed time from August 12th, 1960, that's our baseline, to the DECA audition on January 1st, 1962 was one year, four months, and 20 days. So that by itself doesn't seem to be too extraordinary. But let's now break the one year, four months, and 20 days down to seconds, minutes, and hours and take a look at what we have. 43,804,800 seconds reduces to 9. 730,080 minutes reduces to 9. 12,168 hours reduces to 9. Moving down to the next event I have on the chart, which would be the signing of the contract with EMI, and I should call out that the letters EMI also have numerology of 9. That contract was signed on June 18, 1962, according to the official narrative, and that date is also biological Paul McCartney's birthday. And when we do the numerology on the date, 6 plus 1 plus 8, plus 1, plus 9, plus 6, plus 2, that reduces to 33. And 33 also can reduce down to 6, 3 plus 3, as well as 9, 3 times 3. And moving over to the next column, we have the elapsed time calculation at a high level. Hamburg to the signing of the EMI contract was 1 year, 10 months, and 6 days. But when we look at the seconds, minutes, and hours, they all reduce to the number 9 as well. And then moving down to the next event I have on the chart, which would be when their debut album, Please Please Me, was released, which was on March 22, 1963. The March 22 date was chosen because it associates with Genesis 322, as well as the Skull and Bones number of 322. And 322 is in reference to man being as a god. So go and read Genesis 322 and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Now moving over to the elapsed time column, we start with the Hamburg date of August 12, 1960, and we calculate the elapsed time to the release of Please Please Me, which was on March 22, 1963, we get two years, seven months, and ten days. But when we look at the seconds, minutes, and hours, the seconds reduce to nine, the minutes reduce to nine, and the hours reduce to six. And of course, if we invert the six, we get another nine. Now let's move down to the Faustian bargain. And Memoirs tells us that this took place on October 24th, 1963. And if we do the numerology on the entire date, we get 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 6 plus 3 equals 8. What does 8 represent? 8 represents infinity, the force that regulates cycles of life, death, and rebirth. And what were the Beatles all about? Transformation, change, endings, and new beginnings. It also represents balancing the spiritual and the material, and this is fundamental to Luciferianism. It also represents using power, usually money, 
to get results. And October 24th, without the date, is 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 4, which equals 7. 7 is another number that is all around the Beatles. And the number 7 represents perfection and enlightenment. And I have a footnote down here to show where 7 comes into play. These are just some examples. The Beatles released seven albums between 1962 and 1966, containing 77 original songs. So these are the original songs on the albums. I'm not talking about the singles. And seven years elapsed between the first EMI recording in 1962 and their last recording session, which was Abbey Road in 1969. Now, if we take a look at the elapsed time, starting from Hamburg, August 12, 1960, to when we are told the Faustian bargain took place on October 24, 1963, we get three years, two months, and 12 days. But again, when we break down the seconds, minutes, and hours, we get nine, nine, and six again. And if we flip the six, we get another nine. And then I took a look at their second album with the Beatles, which was released on November 22, 1963. Again, it's the same day that JFK was assassinated. And November 22nd, the reason why that was chosen is because 11 plus 22 equals 33. And if we do the numerology on the entire date, including the year 1963, that reduces to 7. And so the elapsed time from Hamburg to with the Beatles when it was released was 3 years, 3 months, and 10 days. And take a look at the seconds minutes, and hours. Nine, nine, nine. So the question becomes, is this just coincidence? Or is this all planned out? And I mean really planned out. I'll let you decide. And so with that, folks, I will conclude the presentation. The comment section is open. You guys let me know what you think. And we will talk soon. Thanks for listening.